Welcome to the Madison Miller Podcast. Tonight's guest um, tends to come on when big horse races happen. He covers horse racing. His name is Jeffrey Burns. How are you doing on this fine Thursday evening? I'm doing good, Madison. It's a big weekend of racing coming up. Uh, the most exciting time of the year in uh, thoroughbred racing. All righty. That's for sure. But before we get into horse racing, breaking news coming down right now, as you just mentioned to me when... You came on the phone, and that is Kyrie Irving suspended by the Brooklyn Nets. Do we know? Oh, it's for no less than five games, at least five games without pay, as Shams literally just said that right now. And we know that situation and how awful it is of what he did. So what are your thoughts on the suspension? Do you think that's the uh, correct amount of games he should be suspended for? Well, I I think the suspension is very much warranted uh the events over the last uh five days have just been handled so uh just been handled terribly on Kyrie Irving's part on the Nets part on really on the whole NBA uh as part from Adam Silver to just everybody down I mean the video that Kyrie Irving shared on Saturday night is just it's a terrible video it should have been condemned right from the very beginning and the fact that he would double down, triple down, essentially on it when I questioned about it by the media just made the whole situation worse. Uh, the fact that it took Adam Silver five days, like today, to even come out with a statement condemning Kyrie Irving and uh, the video he shared, I think, is a terrible look on his part. Uh, the silence from a bunch of players, I think, is a, a terrible look on their part. I mean, the whole situation is just terrible all around. And I think the suspension is very much warranted. I wish it was at least... Honestly, I think five games is not enough. I think it should be at least a week, maybe even two weeks, until Kyrie Irving actually comes out and apologizes for his comments slash sharing the video, which he hasn't done yet. He says he made some of the video was a mistake, but he didn't actually come out and say he apologized for it. Right. So I I think it's fair. I think it's good that he's suspended. And personally, I I think it's coming to a point where the, the Nets need to get rid of Kyrie Irving like sooner or later. He's becoming such a big distraction for them. I mean, it's. I, I feel like this is the starting point of possibly uh, him uh, sooner rather than later leaving the Nets. I'm with you there. I think that the Lakers are the team that would probably be the most interested in Kyrie Irving. And there's talks that he might get bought out by the Nets. I don't know if that will actually happen. But I wouldn't be shocked if it's a buyout for, uh, for Kyrie Irving. And... Speaking of the Nets, let's stick to them for a second. And um, and by the way, I agree with you about Irving's suspension should be a, a, at least two weeks. And that would, in theory, be like, what, seven games in two weeks? Eight games? Uh, that, that, would, that sounds about right. I know the Nets are starting a road trip uh, starting tomorrow. So uh, that's, the, 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 yeah, that's, about, that's about eight games between now and two weeks from now. Okay, that would make sense. And... Speaking of the Nets, they made some big news on Tuesday. They fired head coach Steve Nash. I was very close to asking you to come on Tuesday night to do the emergency show with me, but then I realized Breeders' Cup's to, um, coming up this weekend, so I wanted to wait to have you on. So uh, what are your thoughts on the Steve Nash firing, and uh, do you think that um, Ime Adoka, as it's been reported, will end up being the guy? Uh, before before we get I get to Steve Nash, the Nets actually just released a statement literally a, a few moments ago on Kyrie Irving, and the most actually the most important part of the statement is quote We are of the view that he is currently unfit to be associated with the Brooklyn Nets. We have decided that Kyrie will serve a suspension without pay until he satisfies a series of objective uh, ob- objective measures. Ooh. So, that's a statement that the Nets just released literally moments ago that I actually just saw on social media. So, wow. Uh, yeah, this that that situation seems like it's going to get a whole lot worse. Absolutely. Uh, him and Kyrie Irving. Um, as far as uh, Steve Nash goes, I think uh, I, I was shocked that he even started the season. He should have been fired a long time ago. Uh, I honestly was not a fan of his as a coach going back to when he was first hired. It just seemed like the players like didn't really respect him, didn't really like, uh, wasn't buying into what he was preaching essentially. And honestly, I, I believe after, it was after the uh, after the game against Indiana on the thirty first, where he basically told uh, Sean Marks and the uh, front office like these guys just aren't listening to me anymore. So when the news came out that he was fired, I honestly think he just walked into the front office and quit. I think he just had enough of this. I 
I think sooner or later it will come out that he actually quit. And it Interesting. was just a mutual decision. Like, okay, yeah, we'll let you go. That's fine. But, I mean, this, this the whole situation is just just a straight-up dumpster fire from top to bottom. As far as uh, Ime Adoku, I mean, the fact that the Celt- uh, he was suspended from the Celtics for some pretty hor- horrendous accusation against him involving uh, certain members of the front office and the fact that the Celtics are just letting him go without compensation indicates they have they want no part of him in their organization at any point in their future. They just are glad to see him gone. So even when, even if he is announced as the head, next head coach, which it looks like he's going to, he's going to have to answer questions as far as what was going on in Boston. Why were you suspended? What, what actions were going on? And that's just going to be another level of chaos with this Brooklyn Nets team. And it's just, it's just getting too much. It's it's just a, a straight up dumpster fire with what's going on in Brooklyn right now. It's the biggest dumpster fire in New York sports. It's not even close. It really no, not even close. It really has took the uh, the Yankees off the map and the um the Knicks with losing three straight off the map. It's all because of the Nets that those two storylines of Boone and Cashman potentially coming back or not coming back and. The Knicks, Tom Thibodeau situation potentially. The Nets are the big distraction that is uh, literally distracting everybody from those, right? Oh, absolutely. This, this is. I, I can't recall a situation that has been handled so poorly by a professional team in any sport, let alone in the New York area, in, in, a, in a long time. Everything from top to bottom has just been. Every decision has been made has been wrong. Every single one. It's like they, I, they just cannot handle adversity or controversy in any way, shape, or form. Between Kevin Durant trying, requesting a trade in the summer, yep. he, he told him and Kyrie, told Sean Marks, we want Steve Nash gone. And what do they do? They brought Steve Nash back. Like, what are we doing here? And personally, I, I actually I want to take this opportunity, Madison, to apologize as a Nets fan to New York Knicks fans. Because for a second, I actually thought maybe, just maybe, uh, the Nets were kind of on the verge of taking over New York. Let me sign KD and Kyrie. But oh, no, I thought that too. I mean, I, I personally want to apologize oh. to all Knicks fans. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Listen, I thought that too. And I was the devastated one when uh, the Nets signed Durant and Irving instead of the Knicks. But the Knicks dodged a huge bullet there for sure. And um, Oh, big time. And then the Yankees... um. They're holding their uh, press conference tomorrow with Boone and Cashman. And Cashman has not been extended yet. So there's that possibility that he might resign or they might fire him or something. Because Hal Steinbrenner said not definitively that Cashman was definitely back. And same for Aaron Boone. He said he plans on bringing back Aaron Boone. But plans on doesn't mean he definitely is because there might be a GM change and that GM might... A new GM could change managers if he wants to. So I'm interested to see how play, that plays out. But I personally think they're both back. What do you think? Oh, uh, yeah. I, they're, they're both coming back. I mean, for, I think there's a deal possibly in place for Brian Cashman. I I think time has run its course with Brian Cashman. As, I mean, 25 years is a long time for somebody in an organization. And the Yankees have only have one world championship in 22 years. I mean, he's made some very questionable moves. I mean, some good moves, but some very a lot more questionable moves in his tenure. I mean, the, the IKF Josh Donaldson trade looks so much worse as the season this season went on, and uh, the Frankie Montas trade was a disaster. I mean, it's, it almost seemed like every single trade deadline move Brian Cashman made this year just either didn't work out or it was just a flat out disaster, and. Aaron Boone's bullpen decisions in the ALCS and, quite frankly, in the entire postseason were just so questionable. I mean, I don't understand why they would be back, but I'm not surprised they're gonna, they would like to be back. Personally, I would rather hear from Hal Steinbrenner. What does he think of all this? Why Why isn't he talking to the fan base? I mean, I know we, I know Aaron Boone and Brian Cashman, they're, the, they're, the two, they're basically the big two, manager and general manager. What, what does Hal Steinbrenner truly think of this organization right now? Does he truly think that we're championship material? Because if he's seeing, I don't know what he's seeing compared to what the fan base is seeing, but it's not good enough. And the Yankees are not going to be anywhere close to another world championship as long as this team is as is is currently intact. And if they lose Aaron Judge this postseason and or this offseason, then we're taking at least 10 steps back 
and we're not going to get close to another World Series, and it's going to be another uh, black mark on Brian Cashman. It's not a good look for them. So, personally, I would much rather hear what Hal Steinbrenner has to say about the current state of the New York Yankees than, quite frankly, Cashman and Boone. I agree with you. I think Hal should be talking with them, honestly. And I'm interested to see what Cashman has to say because, to me, I got to be honest, I'm very surprised that he hasn't been extended yet. So that tells me that the more time that goes, the more likely it is that he might be potentially leaving rather than getting fired. And if Cashman leaves, then that's his own decision, probably the right decision for both sides. And by the way, if Cashman goes to a new team, and I think it's very likely that if he leaves the Yankees, he'll end up on a different team as their general manager next year. Like, I would not be stunned at all if he's somebody else's general manager next year. Would that surprise you if he just went to another team? No, I think there'll be a market for him. I mean, I think I know the Mets are looking for a possible new president of baseball operations, so that would certainly be an opening. Steve Cohen has a lot of money, so he'll def- he could definitely offer Brian Cashman something. But, I mean, honestly, I- I'll be – at this point, I want him to be gone, but – I'm not holding my breath for it. I honestly think he will be back. I'll be very surprised if he's not back. But certainly, if I mean, if, if he does end up resigning or leaving, he de- I think he'll definitely have a market. And I think the Mets would be certainly be a team to uh, look out for as a possible like, president of baseball operations. Yeah, that's who I was thinking, too. That, that would just juice the rivalry up a little bit, right? With oh, the definitely. Mets. <laughs> that would just be the funniest thing. And I think Mets fans would want Brian Cashman, honestly. I think they would, but the Yankee fans just want a new voice. Like you said, time it's run its course, and listen, he's probably a Hall of Fame GM, Brian Cashman, say what you want, but time has run its course, and I'm not an Aaron Boone fan at all, and um, I think, uh, hmm, do you think him or Steve Nash is worse? I would probably say Nash, because I feel like he underachieved with more talent because of Durant. Oh, definitely Steve Nash. <laughs> Steve, Steve Nash is, uh, when when it was first announced as Steve Nash was head coach, I mean, I, I had to, like, refresh my Twitter feed and everything because, like, wait, what? Wait, what, what, why is this guy the head coach? I mean, they have so many options, like, uh, back, back in the day, they could have had, like, Mike D'Antoni. I mean, you know, I, I don't understand what Kenny Atkinson was doing wrong. He was doing a damn good head, co- uh, head good job as head coach. I mean, but Steve Nash was just a bad hire, and it just got worse and worse and worse. I, I don't know, honestly have no idea why he was even allowed to start this season when Nash and Irving wanted him gone, but yet they just insisted, hey, let's run the course. Let's just see where it goes. I mean, I, I'm not surprised that they're off to this 2-6 and six start. And I will say, if, if this keeps up, if they don't keep winning by around the halfway mark of the season, I think there's a good chance they could just – have a fire sale, trade KD, trade Kyrie. I mean, wh- at what point does, do the Nets realize, hey, this is not working anymore? So Something sooner or later is going to have to give with both KD and Kyrie. I agree with you. And one more thing before we get into uh, Breeders' Cup. Do you think that uh, Phillies or Astros end up winning the World Series? Well, after the, uh, <laughs> well, after the, uh, the uh, no-hitter last night, that the Astros threw. I think it's going to be pretty hard for the Phillies to bounce back from that. Uh, I know they still have home field advantage tonight, uh, but, you know, I, I think the Astros have all the momentum right now. So I'll be, I think the Astros will win it ultimately in uh, six or seven. Yeah, I agree with you. And now the reason why you're on this podcast tonight, the Breeders' Cup Classic, it's going to be a great race, I think. So many horses from the Derby and the Belmont and the Preakness in this. I'm very excited for this race. Let's start with the first horse, um, Taiba, 8-1 to one right now. Um, tell us about Taiba and Taiba's chances of winning this race. Well, Taiba, uh, this is one of the horses that uh, for, are for trainer Bob Baffert. Uh, he's coming into his own, actually, uh, uh, along with the second half of the season. Uh, he won the Pennsylvania Derby grade one race at Parks uh, near in Pennsylvania last time out. Uh, he's uh, only been worse than second once in his career. That was in the Kentucky Derby. Came from off the pace, chased a pretty fast pace behind Cyberknife, 
who uh, beat uh, Tava in the Haskell, but turned the tables in the Pennsylvania Derby. Uh, Mike Smith's going to have to work out a good trip from the rail. There is speed to his outside, and life is good, and, and for flight line. But should should life is good set a pretty fast pace in front of him, he definitely should pick up pieces. You know, this horse definitely has been getting better as the season has gone along. He's been working very fast coming in. Like I said, Mike Smith and Boards, he they know both know what to do. Uh, the one pose is going to be tricky, but Tava, if he gets first run, and if he if the leaders end up like going very fast up front. He's definitely going to be around in the end. I think I have a good chance of winning. All righty. Yeah, I like this horse a lot. I like Bob Baffert, too. It's funny that uh, I guess his suspension's done, right? Yeah, his suspension ended in uh, early July. He's been back for a few months now, basically getting everything, uh, getting his stable back up and running. So this is actually his first trip to a uh, Kentucky racetrack since, uh, May, since the Derby in 2021 because of his suspension from Churchill. So... Right, yeah, and I always liked him until what happened at the Derby a few years ago. But I still think he's a a, a pretty good trainer. There's a couple good trainers I like, obviously. Life is good is the two horse. Tell us about life is good. Well, life is good. This horse is going to be a uh, a wild card in here because he he's having a very very good year. He won the Pegasus World Cup in, at Gulfstream Park back in January. Uh, group grade one race. His only race at a mile and a quarter was in the Dubai World Cup at Maidan in late March, where he set the pace and actually was the leading tourney for home before fitting to fourth. It was a deep, tiring racetrack that day, uh, his only finish off the board in his career. Since coming back from Dubai, he's won three straight races, including the grade one Whitney at Saratoga and the grade one Woodward at uh, Belt at uh, Aqueduct. And you know, he's been training really well coming into this race. My biggest concern with him is I don't know if he's exactly a mile and a quarter horse. He's more of a miler slash mile and an eighth horse. He did win the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile at Del Mar last year. So I think he he's going to set the pace, and I think he's going to be a huge factor in how this race ultimately turns out. Because I, I honestly, I think the eventual winner is uh, you know, something we'll mention a little later on. But... As, as good of a year as he's having, I have severe question marks whether he can handle the mile and a quarter. He's going to be setting very fast practice up front. The question is just how far can he go? I just don't know if a mile and a quarter is uh, far enough. I'm with you there. And this is Todd Pletcher's horse, who's my one of my other favorite trainers. He's probably flat out my favorite. Um, my favorite. I like Todd Pletcher. His horses always tend to do really well. The three horse is one of the longer shots. Happy Saver, 30 to 1. Tell us about Happy Saver. Happy Saver, this will be his fifth start of the year, actually his final start before he goes off to become a stallion. But he's had a, he doesn't have a win this year. He's actually 0 for 4 this year. But he has three second-place finishes, including some runner up finishes behind Flight Line, Hot Rod Charlie, and Life is Good, all competing in this Breeders' Cup Classic. So he's definitely consistent. Uh, but he just see, can't seem to get over the uh, get over the hump and get to get the win. But his last uh, out effort in the Lucas Classic, he just chased, he went wide the whole way, just out kicked at the end. He ran a good race in the Whitney two starts back, chasing life is good. Simply just got tired in the end, couldn't chase him down. Um, this horse definitely, uh, I think, has a chance to hit hit the board, whether it be the uh, probably more better for third or somewhere in fourth, but it's going to be very tough for him to win. I know John Velasquez is the board. He's been training well in the mornings, but uh, ultimately I think he's up against it on Saturday. I feel you. I think Happy Saber is against it as well. The favorite, the three to five morning line favorite, Flight Line. Do you agree that Flight Line should be the favorite? I think Flight Line is going to be the shortest price favorite on the entire Breeders' Cup card. Uh, this horse is five for five in his career. He, he a very short career. This is only be his third start of the year, but every time this horse runs, it's just. Uh, I mean, it's it's just an incredible uh, horse to watch. Uh, his his last race in the Pacific Classic was one of the, probably I kid you not one of the best races I think I've ever seen from a racehorse. He went to the lead. This is his very first race at a mile and a quarter at Del Mar. He went to the lead and he started pulling away from the horses down the back stretch. Opened up by ten lengths around the turn and won by nineteen lengths while setting almost setting a track record in the Pacific Classic. It was it was breathtaking a breathtaking race and honestly I highly recommend. Anybody who would go back and watch that race, just how incredible it was. Uh, he is physically, he's one of the most impressive looking horses that I've seen in a long time. 
and on the racetrack when he runs. It's just uh, truly incredible. Uh, I've seen him work work in the mornings, and he's just seems to be getting better and better every single time he, he steps on the track. Seems to be handling Keelan well. Um, usually he's a speed horse, likes to go to the lead, but the fact that life is good is in here. He's going to be chasing life is good. And if he's going to if he's going to win this race, he's going to have to run down life is good going into the turn. And if he can do that and clear, I think everybody else will be running for second. It's going to be it's going to take something truly unforeseen, I think, in my opinion, for life for flight line to be defeated Saturday. Hmm. So you seem very high on flight line. Well, you'll find out eventually if I agree with you there. Hot Rod Charlie, fifteen to one. I think those are crazy odds for Hot Rod Charlie. I think they're too high. What do you think? I think they're too high, too. But uh, I th- honestly, I-, I play those odds at 15 to 1. Me, too. I've always, been a fan- I've always been a fan of Hot Rod Charlie. He's always a consistent racehorse. He shows up all over the country, even all over the world. He ran into the Dubai World Cup back in May, Don, in, in, uh, in March, 10 or 2nd. And he's just taking this, this game all over the country. He ran in the Kentucky Derby and Belmont Stakes in 2021. Ran in the Breeders' Cup Classic last year and finished fourth. But uh, just an ultra-consistent racehorse that just shows up everywhere he goes. Um, this year, he's never been worse than third in five starts. Um, he did win the Grade 2 Lucas Classic last time at Churchill Downs, where he beat uh, this year's Kentucky Derby winner, Rich Strike, who we'll get to a little later on. But you know, he's been working out really good in the mornings. He's been training great. Tyler Gaffleon, who was aboard him for the first time in the Lucas Classic, is back aboard him. I think that's a good move, uh, getting off Flavian Pratt, going to Tyler Gaffleon. Uh, Doug O'Neill has a good record of Keelan, so I think this horse is going to have to sit off the pace, let the pace run out, and he'll probably sit around mid-pack, make good, a good first run. The question is going to be, ultimately, can he hang with life is good, and uh, eventually end flight line, but... Uh, I Rod Charlie, if, if not for a win, I definitely think he'll be, he's a top three contender for sure. I agree with you. I am surprised to see him at 15-1. I thought Hot Rod Charlie would be like in that 10-1 range. Here's a horse I love, Epicenter, 5-1. He's had a good year, Epicenter. Um, and I think that Epicenter, probably the right number, right? Yeah, he's the, he's the right number. He's 5-1 uh, on the morning line. That, that's probably the right number for him. He probably will go off as the second choice uh, behind uh, behind flight line, but uh, yeah, Epicenter has been having a great year. He's seven starts this year. He's never been worse than second. He was he was a hundred yards, ninety fifty yards away from being the Kentucky Derby winner, but then Rich Strike came up along the inside and got him at the wire. He ran into some traffic trouble in the Preakness, finished second again. Uh, his trainer Steve Atkinson gave some t- gave him some time off, and uh, ultimately. At, uh, he went up to Saratoga this summer, and he won the grade two Jim Dandy very impressively. And then in probably the most important race for three-year-olds, other than the Kentucky Derby this year, the grade one Travers, he took the lead off the turn and pulled away to win by six lengths. It was definitely the most impressive I've seen in his career. He's been getting better, maturing, just getting a lot uh, more stronger physically. I think he's coming into this race in, t- in top form. So not this, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Epicenter is going to, I think, run a huge race on Saturday. I definitely think it's a win contender. Absolutely a win contender, I'd say. Two horses left. Seven is Olympiad, or Olympiad, 10-1. to Tell us about Olympiad. I don't remember this horse at all. <laughs> so this is the Olympiad. This is, this is a horse who, it took a little while for him to truly get going in his career. But it wasn't until this year, until 2022, his four-year-old season, where he started coming into his own. Uh, he's run seven times this year. He has six wins, only one loss. Though that one loss did come to life as good in the grade one Whitney. Uh, he was on a winning streak for a while. He won a couple of stakes races down in at the fairgrounds in Louisiana. And then he, wants, uh, he won the Alley Sheep and Stephen Foster at Churchill Downs, uh, both uh, in May and July. And his run of the Whitney was kind of puzzling because he was coming into that race in really good form, top shape, and simply I think he just got he got outrun ultimately by Life Is Good and faded to fourth at the end. Connections were pretty puzzled after that, but um, he came back a month later and and very impressively won the Jockey Club Gold Cup at Saratoga at the mile and a quarter distance, same as the Breeders' Cup Classic. But uh, speed figure wise, and uh, he's not a little bit below. Uh, the top competition in here. 
he's gonna he's a very good horse. I think he's got a chance for the exotics, but if he's gonna win, he's gonna have to run the race of his life on Saturday. All righty, and last but not least, the Kentucky Derby winner who you just alluded to, Rich Strike. He's twenty to one. I think that's I would say Rich Strike probably the right number, but I feel like he's probably gonna have shorter odds than that because people are gonna recognize the name from the Kentucky Derby, right? Yeah, I agree. I, I think twenty to honestly, I think it should be a little higher than twenty to one. I agree. But it won't surprise me one bit if he goes off lower than that because yet he has the name recognition. Of course, he's the Kentucky Derby winner, the feel good story of the year. I mean, honestly, I, I I still can't believe he won the Kentucky Derby me after too. all that trouble he went through. But I mean, honestly, and since since the Derby, he's actually come back and run some good races. Uh, I know his Belmont, he got into trouble. He finished sixth, but. His run on the Travers was actually better than it looked. He finished fourth that day, but he just missed by a, by a neck out of second place. He was in a three-horse photo for second and just missed out on that. And in the Lucas Classic, he was turning for home. He actually took the lead from Hot Rod Charlie, but Hot Rod Charlie came back him on the inside and, and got him at the wire. But it was a very good race, and he's proven he's he's pretty good. He's a good horse. And I know his odds were 90-1 to 1 on Derby Day. He's going to be nowhere close to that on Breeders' Cup Day, but... So he's a horse that's shown, hey, he, he, he's doing well, he's running well. Uh, he, but just like the Kentucky Derby, he's going to need, honestly, a pace meltdown if he's going to have a chance. Maybe he's got a chance for the exams to get into the, to, to get into the top three, but if he's going to win this race, it's gonna, I think it's going to be an even bigger upset than the Derby if he wins the, the Breeders' Cup Classic on Saturday. I think that is correct. I think that... Uh... It would be a bigger upset, too. And I agree with you. Red Strike should be like 25 to 1, I would say. And I do think that 20 to 1 is going to get that down because of the name recognition. All right, let's do our favorite part win, place, and show. I'll let you pick the winner first. Yeah, I, I really don't like playing favorites, but I think Flight Line is just way too good for this field. I mean, honestly, going back, his, uh, I'm going to go Flight Line for the win. I know there's odds of three, three to five morning line. And honestly, it might be lower than that. He could go off to like one to two odds, even one to five. Wow. I mean, this horse, I mean, the hype on this horse coming into this race is we haven't seen in a very, very long time. And honestly, if you go back and you watch his run of the Pacific Classic, it was, like I said, it's one of the most breathtaking races I think I've honestly ever seen. And I'm not over-exaggerating it. I mean, horse, what he did in the Pacific Classic is not what horses should do. Like going around, his move around the turn where he just constantly pulled away. Everybody behind him was in an all out drive and his jockey Flavian Pratt was just standing still on him, just like a Saturday afternoon stroll. It was visually one of the visually like, like I said, one of the most best races I've ever seen. And it's it's gonna have to take a Herculean effort almost, I think, from everybody else in this field to beat him on Saturday. Alrighty. Just to be different, I don't like the big betting the big favorites as well. I just think five to one epicenters is crazy value for a horse that's not the favorite and with the horse as big as a favorite as flight line. So I'm gonna take epicenter for the win and I'm actually gonna go with flight line for the place. Who's your pick for the place? My pick for the place uh, actually is epicenter. Uh He's never been worse than second in his seven starts this year. He's been training outstanding physically. He's probably the best I've seen him look all year long. Uh, I think the uh, the mini break he got after the Travers is going to benefit him. Uh, now the only like I said, the only way he I think could upset Flight Line is if the, if life is good and Flight Line just have a big speed duel in front of him and he just picks up the pieces. But Epicenter is good enough where he he would he would definitely be the favorite if Flight Line wasn't in here. But he's good enough, I think, where he could definitely have a chance. But also, I think he'll come in second. Oh, wow. Stolen base in the World Series. Uh, who just got thrown out at second base there? Oh, man. Sorry, I just went into baseball there for a second. But, um, uh, it's all good. Yeah. Wow. That's a huge stolen base right there. And the Astros are up one nothing. by the way. It was an RBI single. And then, how about your pick for the show? My pick for show is Taba, the num- number one for Bob Baffert. Uh, he's coming into his own this uh, the second half of the year. His Pennsylvania Derby was really good. Uh, his workouts have been really good coming in. He's going to have to work out a trip from the rail, but I think ultimately he's going to be good enough to at least get a piece of it. 
Uh, I think so. unless barring something crazy, you know, Bob Baffert is known for winning some actually some pretty big upsets with the Breeders' Cup Classic. So uh, they, anything can happen when if, if he enters, enters a horse. So I think Table will finish third. And honestly, uh, the connections have already said he should be back in 2023. So he definitely could be a player in next year's uh, Classic Division as well. Wow. All righty. So I'm going to go with Hot Rod Charlie for show. Because 15-1, to 1, I think that's ridiculous odds for him to win. I think Hot Rod Charlie's a good horse. So I'm going to go with um, Hot Rod Charlie for the show. And by the way, it was Jeremy Pena that had the RBI single and was thrown out trying to steal second. It yeah, it was Pena. And then uh, Bregman just strikes out, so Syndergaard gets out of a uh, a little bit of a jam, only down one nothing. All right, before we go quickly, thoughts on the 6-2 and two New York football giants as we head into the bye? Well, first, I, I, you could not, honestly, you could not have asked for a better start to a season. I mean, honestly, I, going into the season, I thought the Giants were going to get the number one overall pick because of how. But I thought the roster was not very good. They had to cut a lot of high priced guys. There were a lot of question marks on Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley, but, I mean, they just surprised us week in and week out. I mean, it's truly amazing what they've done this year. I mean, I know they lost to Seattle. I just think they were gassed in that game. I mean, the, with all the travel, with all the some injuries that just kind of caught up to them. But honestly, you honestly could not have asked for a more perfectly timed bye week as well. I mean, this is a perfect bye week for them to get rested and get ready for the second half of the year. So uh, hopefully they can keep it going. We'd love to see it keep it going and make a, po- make a postseason run. But uh, it's it's truly truly amazing what we're seeing from the Giants right now. I know. I'm fired up, too. I thought they would have a top-five pick. I think I predicted them to finish last in the division at 5-12, and 12, but they've exceeded my expectations regardless of how the season plays out. I think they're going to end up probably 10-7 and seven kind of feels right for them. Maybe a little better than that. Maybe it'll be 11-6. and six. But the Eagles and the Cowboys are just so good. They're in the, the NFC... East isn't the NFC least anymore. It's the NFC beast. Even the Commanders are 500. Yeah, I know. This very quickly has become like one of the laughing stocks divisions in football to arguably the best. I mean, it's amazing what the turnaround has been for this, this, the entire NFC East. The AFC East is the AFC beast now, too, because of the Dolphins making their move for Bradley Chubb, the Bills being really good. But I'd say the NFC East is better than the AFC East because... um. I think the Jets might um, might um, not be as good as they were in the first half because of the injuries they sustained to Brees Hall and Elijah Vera Tucker. Oh, Kyle Schwarber just homered. Oh, yeah. So yeah, we got a 1-1 uh, game. Yeah, as far back to the Jets, I think the uh, the loss of Brees Hall and Elijah Vera Tucker are going to really hurt that offense. And uh, obviously, I know Michael Carter is pretty good, but obviously Brees Hall certainly will be missed. And uh, that's, that's a big loss for them. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Jeff, it was a pleasure to have you on as always, and we hope to have you on hopefully in December and the Giants are still playing meaningful football. All right, thanks for having Madison. The Breeders' Cup is Friday and Saturday, some good races all around. Breeders' Cup Classic will go off at uh, 5.40 p.m. Eastern on NBC. So it should be a fun race and uh, very much looking forward to it. Yep, looking forward to watching it. Talk to you soon. All right, thanks, Madison. All righty.